This is the Anarchist War Journal entry number six, and I'm going to continue with the next interview I had at that International Students for Liberty conference with the amazing anarchist that is Jan Hellfield. His uh, rise to fame is uh, came from a series of interviews that he conducted with many political rulers using the Socratic method, showing their inconsistencies, showing that areas in which they do advocate for force, do advocate for theft, and while those videos themselves are amazing, the errors that, uh, that always just seems to kind of fall flat is that why don't you apply that within your own night watchman state ideas as well, right? Because you necessarily must also advocate for force, must necessarily also advocate for theft, and uh, the same kind of problems in which you expose political rulers in having, uh, you should be able to come to find that it's the same problems Americanists will also face as well. And so I've been looking for him for the entire weekend. I know he lives in D.C. and he will not miss such an opportunity to come out here and um, Socratically interview uh, the guests and the people that are there. So I found him. <laughs> I found him on the last day while Julie Broska was giving her talk. And I was going to go and interview her after she was finished talking. But uh, Jan Helfi was already there first. So I kind of saw that he would have the first opportunity to talk to her and... Um, so I, I kind of, I guess, intervened for a minute and uh, asked him if uh, we could have an interview um, while she's giving her talk and during that time uh, have a discussion. And uh, he gladly said yes. So we sat outside in another area of the lobby, which is uh, a good portion away. But all of this is, uh, there's a reason why I'm describing this event because it's going to match up later when he actually does have an interview with Julie Broski. And so these are some interesting puzzles that will make you laugh because I find it to be very hilarious. So we sat out there and we had our, we had our talk, which lasted about, I don't know, 25 minutes or more. So that's what we're gonna watch right now. Um, the guy reminds me of my grandfather, actually, <laughs> who escaped from Cuba. It looks kind of like him. He's got uh, the same kind of demeanor and, um, so maybe I wasn't as, uh, as, you, as you found, I'm not really as harsh during the discussions, right? Um, generally, I like to just let people hang themselves on their own words. Uh, but you kind of have to have uh, the dialogue going and so that that area can be further revealed. So we sat down and let's uh, take a look at what happened. My name is uh, Kamal Lene and you are Jen Hellfield and I've seen right. a lot of uh, your videos in the past and I applaud you for your great Socratic uh, method that you've done um, and particularly the one with Bernie Sanders. Thank you. That's um, yeah. been very popular recently. Right. <laughs> Especially today. Unfortunately he's not doing too well. No he's not. Hillary. Right. Yeah I hope he wins. <laughs> <laughs> That'll increase my views. <laughs> It's kind of like uh, there's a guy who kind of looks like uh, Bill Clinton, you know, I guess sometimes uh, uh, Saturday Night Live, the people kind of look like some of the presidents. They're out of a job if, you know, the president no longer is in office or... Right. <laughs> you know, there's another uh, actual reason why I like him to win, because one of the big problems of American politics is that the distinctions between philosophy are not drawn, because the two parties, Republican and Democrat, try to eke out the middle so they become very similar because the whole strategy is to get the other guy, the other party on the 49 percent and eke out the 51 percent to win the election. So differently in Europe, for example, when you get proportional representation, it's not a winner-take-all election, you are able to discuss the issues and take positions. So you got a communist party, you got a socialist party, you got a capitalist party, you got so you can have a discussion of ideas and we don't get that in America. So that's very frustrating. That's that's very true. Yeah. Um, so if he won, maybe we could have that. You're gonna have that <laughs> I mean what do you think about uh I mean him hanging his, you know, Soviet communist flag, right? Uh, in his office, right? So it yeah, I decided to just ignore the Bernie Sanders advocation there. Um, it could be something for me to jump on and, and get into, but at the same time, it's, uh, it'll lead to a different tangent, uh, way off mark, off track where I'm trying to go. That's something that I could bring up later, but I need to get through these questions and definitions first. So don't think that I'm uh, trying to skirt around it or trying to ignore it. Um, 
I'm, I'm going for, I'm trying to bake something beautiful here. And uh, if I take it out of the oven prematurely, it's not going to rise well, you know, so to speak. It's a lot of weird stuff about him in general. But I guess that's a topic for another conversation about Bernie Sanders. I guess wondering, how do you define uh, a free market? Free market is a market uh, where the relationships uh, between adults are based on mutual consent for mutually perceived self-interest. So that's the underlying principle of a free market. It means that uh, people are uh, respected, not forced to take actions either through force or fraud against their judgment. Essentially what the free market does is that it uh, protects a fundamental value that human beings need to have protected by their nature, which is their judgment. To be able to follow your own judgment as long as you don't violate someone else's rights. So I guess uh, consent, respect for private property, voluntary exchange? Well, yes, it's it's mutual consent, and uh, but the, the value that's being protected is the individual judgment of each individual human being. We're talking about adults because when you're a kid, you, your judgment is suspect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could say that. They're still learning and trying to figure out the world. Yeah, right. that's um, so would you say today that we have a free market? No, we, right. we have a mixed economy. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's no mixed economy. It's, it's a state-controlled economy. Um, wherever there is consent and without the coercion and theft and taxation and uh, restriction and socialism, uh, when you don't have any of that, you have you can have a free market there, right, between the individuals. But of course, the products in which they have traded with have also been taxed heavily uh, along the production line. So it's difficult to have a free market when the government just seethes this way and parasitically just destroy and corrupts everything it touches. So yeah, there's no mixed economy. It's it's a state controlled economy at this point, uh, and. That's why we don't have much growth, and that's why we, we are in economic stagnation, because a mixed economy isn't going to perform. We have aspects of free market, and to some degree, and we have aspects uh, of a controlled, planned economy. Right, like wherever uh, the state interferes, because it's not a mutual consent there, uh, like eminent domain will say at any time, that's not your land. Uh, property tax will say, that's not your house. Laws like on cannabis will say, that's not your body, <laughs> right? Um, would you, here at this conference, uh, at, here that we are today, would you consider yourself a libertarian? Absolutely. And how would you define a libertarian? Well, actually, I'd consider myself even uh, more fundamentally an objectivist. Nice. I once, too, also considered myself an objectivist many, many years ago, back when I was a young man, introduced to me by the smartest uh, woman on the planet. And so... Yeah, a lot of good stuff there to be fine for sure. Uh, especially look into the virtue of selfishness. Great place to start off, um, I guess, a good purview of objectivism. An objectivist, okay. <laughs> yeah, because uh, all, all, all uh, objectivists are libertarians, but all libertarians are not objectivists. Okay. <laughs> so the, the broader category, you know, so I, obviously, yes, I am a libertarian. I would say a libertarian is a person who is committed to individual rights and uh, wants you to have your rights respected and and is in favor of uh, the principle that I mentioned initially. Mutual consent. Uh, which is that relationships should be based on mutual consent. I also include with, mutual, with individually perceived self-interest. In other words, each individual is deciding what they think is good for them. Right. So that I, I Like the invisible hand it, in the market, right? I, yeah, the, the invisible hand is just a result of all the people making their free choices. Right, in pursuit of their self-interest. Rational self-interest, I would say. Beautiful. If you're an objectivist, you should say rational self-interest. Right. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, just because you're doing what you want to do doesn't mean it's in your self-interest. You could be making a mistake. Okay. But in a, in a free society, we respect the yeah. fact that if you want to make a mistake with your own life, with your own money, as long as you're not uh, violating other people's rights, yeah, go for it. If I think your opportunity <laughs> cost is kind of irrational, I'll, we'll say it otherwise, right? right. Um, all right, so I guess in terms of a libertarian, so I guess uh, would that fall with like the non-aggression principle against the initiation of force in terms like of mutual consent? Yeah, so 
Uh, yes, uh, you, the principle that Ayn Rand identified originally, the non-initiation of physical force, uh, was identified to give a guideline between when you're violating somebody else's rights and when you aren't, so that you know clearly, because you see, ever since I was a kid, they said, your rights finish where the other guys start. But what's the line? How do you know where the line is? Mm -hmm. And the way you know is if you're initiating force against the other guy, you've crossed the line. Vice versa, if he's initiating force against you, he's crossed the line. But both uh, libertarians and objectivists forget that initiating force is not the only way you can cross the line. There's another way, which is fraud. Exactly, yeah. Scamming people. <laughs> it's a form of theft. Right, right, right. So that's why I mentioned in the beginning of this interview what is the value that's being protected? Because what happens when I put a gun to your head, I force you to go act against your judgment. But when I lie to you about whether the watch I'm selling to you is gold or not, I'm not using force, but I'm also getting you to go against your judgment. Because if you knew the truth, your judgment would be different. So I'm getting you to go against your judgment. Right, and that's the so that's the value that's being protected, you see. Yeah, and this that uh, eliminates all these uh, arguments. Oh well, in this case, the violation of right they didn't use force. That's true. That's it's not only force. It's also through fraud. Right, and in the form of theft, in terms of like contract theory, right? Uh, you're selling me uh, some apples on the contingent that these are good apples, right? So I will transfer the title ownership of my money on the condition that these are good apples. That they're not rotten. Yeah, that they're not rotten. Uh, but if you give me the, the apples... the bottom of the barrel, they're all rotten. They're all rotten, right? <laughs> and then, so you don't have permission for that money, right? It's not, it was not given consent to that, and that would be the fraud, right? Right. And, uh, and in that case, yes, yeah, consumer people... Are but there was no can... force involved. Right, yeah. Actually, well, I should have said that there was force. I would say force is a violation of consent, right? Violation of consent over uh, things you own, property of your own, or especially self-ownership. So the initiation of force violates consent. Uh, theft is a big area that falls underneath that as well, and there's a lot of different categories, subsets that fall underneath that, fraud in particular. And, but I believe when he's saying there's no, phys no force, it seems that he's implying physical force, like uh, putting your hands on someone um, physically or imposing or threatening, right? Uh, I mean, putting a gun at someone, that's the initiation of force. So you can uh, look at that and examine it further. So I would disagree with him there and, and I have a contention with that, actually. But, but uh, it's a violation. You know, uh, objectives have a rationale to try to make that force. In my view, it's not force. It's just that it's just you're protecting judgment. And there's two ways to violate somebody's judgment. All right. Um, yeah, I, I, so, yeah I, I find kind of the same thing, right? You either advocate for, advocate for consent or you don't, right? You know, it's kind of black and white. Anne Rand would have said, there's no gray area, right? Gray area is kind of acknowledged that there are black and white positions. You can't have gray without either one well, of them. Yeah, either you are acting freely or you aren't. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but either you are allowed to follow your judgment, mm -hmm. understanding the situation, or you aren't. Right. So fraud is inducing you to do something against your judgment by misleading you as to the facts so you won't follow your you will follow a mistaken judgment if you knew the facts you would do something different right I guess sometimes I, I feel like that way with uh, Bernie Sanders or a lot of politicians in that way right uh, and uh, the things that they, they kind of put out there and trying to appeal to you know, bread and circuses kind of promises empty promises right misleading people into believing that politics will set them free Bernie Sanders is going to provide them they're all paradise. doing it now yeah they're all doing it Trump. now Trump Sanders, yeah. <laughs> Hillary, yeah, everyone, everyone. <laughs> yes. There's no good candidates. I'm going crazy because <laughs> I like to vote. <laughs> what, right, so I guess a lot of people here don't like to vote, but I, I, I like to vote. You like to vote, and I like to find somebody that I can vote for. <laughs> but what, what are these sometimes people? you can't. Right, right. But what do you see like these people though, like uh, the, these politicians though? Would they would be advocating for the initiation of force though to have their 
policies are absolutely. opinions yeah, so right? redistribution of wealth is uh, it's still theft right yeah, yeah. It, it is uh, uh, theft it's legalized theft that's what, yeah they yeah. call it yeah. so you're yeah, not allowed well, to steal we'll, 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 we'll call it, call it. Right. Yeah. And, uh, essentially it's theft but it's legalized because it's, it's done legally right which is uh, you know a corruption of the constitutional perspective of uh, not depriving people of their property without due process of law, which for a long time protected American citizens, you know, until we got some new uh, decisions by the Supreme Court. But originally, that's kind of redistribution of wealth was out the window. Right, yeah. Uh, in terms of, like, uh, the Constitution uh, in that area, um, you know, there's uh, no, no one signed the Constitution either, right? They signed it in witness whereof, right? And, like, uh, when you go to a notarizer, they sign it in witness or of, not that I'm going to be held liable to the terms and uh, responsibilities of the contract and outlined in there. Right? Well, the Constitution was signed by people that were elected to be representatives of uh, the, the various parts of the country where they came yeah. from. And, and, and as a contract, uh, um, that would be held only to those people, right? If I had a contract with you and me and, and us here, the terms and limits are between our party, right? Not with uh, right. everyone but, else that's not... The, the thing is that uh, they, they had agreed at the time, uh, at this time, that the, all the people believed that they needed a government in order to have their individual rights protected. And what they agreed to do is, on proper functions of government, to allow majority rule and to have a representative uh, vote for what they actually uh, what, what would what would go into law so, so you and me can make a contract with, where an uh, underlining social contract which is implied really but it doesn't exist it, it's not in, a, in paper but it, it represents the thinking of the people at the time and still all the people that uh, believe in having a government uh, also s still think that, that they need a government in order to have their rights protected. So you can do that uh, where I agree that even though I don't agree with the exact uh, legislation that's being passed in this area, say uh, defense spending, I would prefer less defense spending, but I have uh, agreed to cede that decision to majority rule. You can make that kind of contract, and that's totally legitimate, and you can uh, delegate that to the government. And essentially, that's what, in my view, happened when there was a constitutional convention. Right, but yeah. I would ask, though, then, uh, you know, there, there exists, though, no factual evidence of a contractual relationship with government. Right, so well, the, the contract there, doesn't it, exist. But, no, it, it's not, as I said before, every society is... Uh, based on certain implied principles. They're implied, they're not, they're written in the contract. Fortunately for the United States, our founding fathers attempted to put it in writing, which is much better than for it just to be totally implied. But what was obvious to everyone, and not so obvious now to some, like yourself, who's an anarchist, is that you needed a government to protect your individual rights. And so that there wasn't any disagreement about that. There was disagreement about how much power the government should have, should it be limited, in what way, etc. So on that count, there was agreement, even though there, it, it wasn't in a, a signed document. In fact, the, there's nobody that I know that was arguing at the con Constitutional Convention or in the streets that uh, they didn't want to have any government at all. But they did it in secret in Philadelphia, right? Aside from everyone else. And then they redid well, the whole entire constitution well, and they, rewrote the whole thing in secret they, and, and to make they, it stronger. They, they did meet in secret. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but that, that's not very open, they right? That because they, wanted to, they were involved in negotiations. And they brought them back to the states and they got ratified, if I recall correctly. Uh, Among but them. The, but the main point here from the perspective of the anarchists is there was a view that was unanimous, that you needed a government. There's no factual evidence to support that. I would say it's not unanimous no. between those people, though, in that group. No, no, not like in those people. I mean, the people in, it, there's nobody opposed 
the, uh, that there should be any government. It was only for a tiny minority of people who were land owning, not for everyone else, like the women or children who cannot there participate. Was, there were some, uh, the, the Constitution wasn't a, a perfect document, and it, all it did was identify the fact that the proper function of the government should be to respect the individual rights and protect the individual rights of the citizens. And so. All right, so that, that, that would create that, citizens, that, right? That, that, right. But that, that was the fundamental uh, perspective. Okay, yeah. And I understand like the history of it and these ideals. And what you're saying would be correct uh, and what the document was attempting to outline and the people. And uh, so well, well, this together. is the way it is with uh, political freedom and progress. Uh, what happened in the Constitution was that a large class of citizens were granted the protection of their individual rights. Like you said, the men, the women weren't included because culturally they... A lot of men also were not included. Well, if they were slaves, they weren't included. Like property-owning people, uh, people, like in Britain, suffrage was not included to all men, just a small right, percentage. Right. So, but the point that I'm trying to make is this, that uh, once you introduce the principle that in this class of citizens, it, the, your individual rights should be respected, then it's only a, a matter of reasoning to say, well, this person's a human being also, so they should be uh, granted the protection of their individual rights. And this woman is also a human being, and therefore she should also be granted the same... To protection, you're trying to say, the right? Same, the same protection of her individual rights. And that's how you expand. If you want to go back even farther bef before the Founding Fathers, the Roman Republic, uh, certain groups, a large segment of the population had had rights, and that's where you know that's where John Locke gets his idea, I think, hmm. and uh, that's why you have a republic, which means the public part, which means there's a private part, which means government hands off my private part. We can do elections and we can decide things regarding the public part. In other words, the proper function of government, and so that's a matter of expanding the basic principle to apply to all the other people to whom it logically should apply. Okay. Uh, in terms of citizenship, like you're trying to say, you're explaining that uh, By you're the giving way, are out... are we going to miss our interview? Oh, no, our no, 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 we're going to wrap this up real quick. Two more, uh, a few well, more questions. Uh, in no, terms of citizens... Uh, well, we've done a lot more than two or three questions, the last thing Dan, is but let me say this. But, 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 well, I'm going to let you, okay, let you okay, ask okay. more questions. Okay, I'm not going to cut you off. <laughs> but um, you, it's a very profound and... Uh, deep interview and uh, on political philosophy and so go ahead hit me with your next right, question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so you're saying that there is protection provided for citizens right and in return the citizens provide a political allegiance to the body politic as long as they protect their rights. Is sort of saying that's what the Constitution is doing? No the Constitution is putting in, in print a perspective that was enunciated in the Declaration of Independence which is uh, to secure these rights, as they say in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson's phraseology, governments are constituted, telling you that the only proper function of a government is to secure the individual rights of the citizens, in his terminology, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I would have put in uh, property as well, which was uh, Lockean uh, perspective. So that's what they that's what they attempted to do in in more uh, detail by limiting the power of the federal government and uh, dividing jurisdictions between the federal government and the state government and all sorts of other stuff by. Uh, that's what they. Yeah. That's what they did. So I would say though, but if there's no protection, right? There is thus no political allegiance. Thus, there is no such thing as citizens, right? You have many Supreme Court cases, like Minnie Baker versus DeShaney County, that have decreed that there is just no obligation to protect your life, liberty, or property. It does not exist. So there is no obligation to protect your life, liberty, or property. Oh, well, well, there is we no have, political we have allegiance. The so original, there exists, well, well, if there's no protection, there's no citizenship. Then. The, I don't know about no citizenship because you still have a passport and everything. But <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's just, but, but, uh, uh, 50 uh, years ago you didn't need a passport. Right. 
50 right? years? I don't yeah, 50 years ago, you didn't need a passport to freely travel, right? And the thing I think is, you did. no, no, there's a time you never need passports to travel. You didn't need it all the time. Ever since I can remember, you remember all the. <laughs> <laughs> and in the anyway. areas in terms of like protection, though, how can governments say that they're here to protect you when first they must rob you of your property through taxation in order to say that we're here to protect your property? So you see, I think uh, people have a right to get together. Those people that think that you need a limited government in order to have optimum protection of your rights have the right to get together and form a government. I think that's what they did essentially when they uh, had the Constitutional Convention and did, wrote the Constitution. A different question is, okay, now in that country, in that geographical area that is dominated by the disagreement uh, by this government, people pop up, maybe like yourself, and say, you know, I don't like this deal. I don't think I need a government, a limited one, or any other kind, to have my rights protected. I want to have an anarchist society. I want real protection. And, well, you think you're going to get real protection in the anarchist society. We don't have protection today. Doesn't it exist? Well, you have... The Supreme Court judges have ruled there is no protection, no allegation, doesn't exist. Well, I think that we have various degrees of uh, protection and it could be, they can be doing a better job or a worse job. But I still, I think uh, you still do have uh, protection uh, against but foreign the, but tyrants. But facts and have said uh, that it doesn't exist. I was in the military myself, mm -hmm. right? So I thought I was defending the freedoms here, but it's here at home that we're losing our freedom, it's not overseas, right? If we grant the military as a measure of success to defend our freedom, we will have more freedom today than we did versus five years ago, 20 years ago, before the National Defense Authorization Act, before the Patriot Act, before the increasing rise of taxation and restriction of markets. I believe the mission has failed. Well, I, I'm not following exactly uh, I'm saying that we don't have that security, uh, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, well, it doesn't exist. No, I don't, I think security, how well the government is performing its job, uh, and uh, having uh, securing the individual rights of the citizens has varied, and in uh, many regards, uh, we've got, it's been eroded. I think there is a degree of protection. I differ from you. I think the government is protecting us fine from foreign tyrants. That's an important job. I think. Uh, I think the, the tyrants are here. Well. You, Every politician is a tyrant when they, they want to take your pot. The police, uh, when they put you in a cage for a victimless well, crime. Well, okay, so what you want to do is um, argue the... I guess uh, my, my turn about like, what, what do you think about uh, uh, an opportunity for you to, to have a contractual but, obligation but for security? Did you understand what I said before? What I said is that people like yourself who think that you can get optimum protection, which, as you remember I said it was in degrees, and what you're looking for is optimum. And think that under anarchism, you can have optimum protection. I'm in favor of people like that who say, look, I think we're getting very little protection. So I would get a lot more protection under anarchism or anarcho-capitalism, I guess you, yeah. you believe in. And my own view is that you should have the right to buy land in the United States, when you got enough, you, you get enough ownership of a place uh, big enough to make a, a country, you can secede, and I think that should be uh, part of the proper uh, legislation in any country, because you have a fundamental difference of opinion that is irreconcilable, that is unintegratable with the majority of the population, 99% or whatever they are. So, I'm all in favor of, and by the way, I would like that same right for myself. Yeah, freedom of association. Wait a second, wait a second. You don't know exactly what I'm going to say. I would like that those of us that believe in limited government and think that this welfare state has eroded our, our liberties way too far, 
and uh, got us into all kinds of wars we don't need to be in. And so we've strayed from our original uh, perspective. I would like to write to do the same thing I'm offering you. Those of us that believe in limited government, I think there must be 15 or 20 percent in, in the United States. Buy land in some part of the United States, big enough for us to have our own state, mm -hmm. and secede. And that's why I was a, an original founding member of the Free State Project. <laughs> and I work with Jason yeah. to do the Free State Project. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it didn't pan out uh, as we hoped, uh, partly because New Hampshire is too cold. <laughs> <laughs> so look, uh, I, I, wanna, I don't want to miss our interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, oh, so we just come to the conclusion. You have your community. We have our community. We respect the private property boundaries of each other's communities, and we can have our way of life as long as it's mutually consensual. Right? Yeah, so, uh, and so people can have, uh, if they have a fundamental difference in political theory and philosophy, they should have a right to organize according to that philosophy, like I think the Founding Fathers did with whatever, uh, you know, criticisms you want to make that this lady right. and this and yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Okay? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, please uh, <laughs> continue let's, more of your Socratic method out there. Let's, uh, let's go see if we can... We have yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. So there you have it. That was the interview I had with John Hellfield. And as you can see, it went to a lot of different places. And of course, it's a discussion, a conversation, so I can't uh, interrupt uh, while he's talking, right? And let him finish out his ideas and um, the tangents and where it goes to. Um, I have really had a lot of fun talking with him, so I would love to have more follow-up conversations. So from there, of course, uh, you can find the staunch constitutionalism that's in him. Which, of course, again, no one signed the Constitution. It's not a real contract. Um, and, of course, you can't say that everyone gave consent to it when there's no factual evidence to support any of that. Right? Again, there exists no factual evidence of a contractual relationship with government. does not exist. Social contract is not real. And so, of course, from there, there's always been this presumption of security where there is none, right? Government first must necessarily rob you of your private property in order to make the lying claim that we're here to protect you, to protect your property, right? And so, yeah, uh, kind of logically deducing from that, it must necessarily commit acts of evil before it can say we're here to do good, um, optimal good, right? And so with that kind of stuff aside, uh, it's good to see that, yeah, you know, he's, uh, he, he would allow, that's the weird part, right, uh, anarchists to buy up a plot of land and to create their own society outside of the state. And whereas he would also seek the same kind of permission to secede and do the same thing. Um, of course, I wasn't going to interrupt every single time. I felt there was a contention or disagreement uh, there's like a bigger stuff there that I want to get through first. And of course, my area of uh, not so much disagreement is like, uh, you know, there's no one who has been delegated such a right to grant me such permission, permission, right? Or to say that I can and cannot do that, right? My my home is here in Richmond. This is where my, my community lives, my tribe uh, gathers together. And so I'm not interested in finding land out there in the middle of nowhere and seceding over there. Secession begins at an individual level. It begins and ends there. That's the only place where uh, anyone could ever secede, right? You can't show me a state without showing me individual people. There's individu individual people who let go of the idea of the need of such a violent, murderous institution to solve the problems that secession begins. And so, it's again, it should be those that advocate for theft, for taxation, for for murder, for mayhem, for hurting peaceful people, for government that should leave and get out of society and find their own plot in the middle of the woods somewhere, right? Civilization belongs to the civilized, not to the barbarians. Not to the barbarians like the founding tyrants 
who went to war against taxation, but then turned around and did the Whiskey Rebellion because some people didn't want to pay some whiskey tax, right? And so, yeah, some contentions here and there, but uh, he's, a, he's a fun guy and seemed to uh, kind of flow well with the discussion. Um, and so other than that, uh, <laughs> hopefully you guys enjoy that. Right after the conversation ended, uh, we're about to head back towards Julie Browski because she had just finished her talk. People were kind of leaving and he had uh, used to wash him. So I directed him far away in another direction, but I believe there was a washroom. Only so I can kind of beat him first and, and get the interview with Julie Borowski. And because uh, I know that if he had had the interview with her first, um, very certain that he would have placed her in a very sour mood afterwards because uh, he likes to trip people up, right? He likes to trick them up and Socratically as he does with all his other interviews. And that would not have uh, placed it in a good standing for me then to come in afterwards and have <laughs> my interview if she would even uh, accepted it afterwards, right? So strategizing and thinking ahead, um, beat him to it. And that's gonna be the next video that I show. And of course, uh, if you have a chance to watch his version of Julie Broski, you'll see it of him coming right after my interview is already done and finished. <laughs> so if you wanna know why his version is very cringe-worthy, um, that's why. So if you're watching this, Jan Hillfield, thank you so much for the uh, conversation. That was a lot of fun. And I look forward to running to you again in DC. And with that, uh, Oh well, yeah, I've uh, reached over a thousand subscribers now for the YouTube channel. So thank you all of you for, for watching, for your support. And if you guys haven't had a chance to look at the Patron, uh, please check it out. And if you enjoy what I do in terms of spreading anarchy, uh, help and assist me to do it more efficiently. So with that, see you guys at the Virtue Party and take good care.